All right. Welcome everybody to the session. Great to all have you here on this Friday morning. Also, uh, there will be people participating online. So great to all have you here. Uh, my name is Maxime Eislin. I work for IUCN in the Netherlands. Uh, I've been to Uganda twice. Uh, I've seen some of the oil developments and the problem is huge. Um, I will be your moderator of today. And uh, this session will also be live streamed. So please be aware that if you say something, then this will be heard and seen also uh, online on YouTube. Also for people participating uh, online, you can ask questions in the YouTube chat, uh, which I can uh, ask during the panel discussion to the speakers. Um, so next slide, please. So basically this session is about how to manage oil risk in biodiverse areas. Um, we will answer this question using a, some of the cases in DRC in Uganda, uh, because they sit in, on a lot of oil resources and um, the area is one of the most biodiverse areas in the world. There are also many national parks, Virunga National Park, Murchison Falls National Park, Bidunga Forest Reserve and many other protected areas. And they, have, and they have one of the highest biodiversity uh, in the world. Uh, they're also home to many iconic species like giraffes, elephants, hippos, now crocodiles, lions, antelopes, and many others. So the oil explanation, uh, exploration is already uh, ongoing. Here you see, for instance, uh, some giraffes with uh, some oil drilling activities. Uh, so the problem is huge right now. The Chinese are uh, expanding their, their roads towards uh, through, through uh, the Merchant Falls National Park to facilitate uh, the oil production. So we should speak out loudly against this disaster in the making. And we are lucky to have a few very vocal uh, local communities in there, uh, religion-based organizations. Uh, we have uh, CSOs that lobby and advocate against these oil developments. So in this session, we have a few amazing speakers that made it all the way from uh, DRC and um, Uganda and Kenya. And uh, they will show their work, present their work, uh, share their experiences and lessons learned on how to deal with, with this issue. So I want you to leave the room inspired um, with the solutions that, that are available uh, to tackle these oil measures. Uh, so next slide, please. We will have a set of amazing speakers. Uh, first, we start with Diana from the Africa Institute for Energy Governance, Aviego. Then we have Father Benedict Ayodi from the Laudato Sea Movement. Next, we have Bantu Lukambo from the Congolese CSO uh, Innovation for the Development and Protection of the Environment, IDPE. Next, we have uh, a Q&A uh, where you can ask questions to the speakers. So if you have any questions, remember them, write them down so you can ask them to the speakers. And then last but not least, we have a next slide surprise speaker. So please make sure that you will be here to uh, witness this uh, surprise speaker. Uh, next, okay. So I would like now would like to hand over to um, Diana. Um, she will present her work uh, of uh, that 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 she was doing uh, in Afiego. She is the head of programs and communications, and she has led a lot, of fair, a lot of projects aimed at promoting nature conservation in oil concession areas in the Alpatine Rift Valley. Uh, so big applause for uh, Diana. Okay, um, thanks, Maxim. Um, could we have my slides? So, um, Thanks, Maxim, for that uh, great introduction and uh, good morning to everyone who is here. 
on site and to all those who are online. Thanks for coming to listen to you know, our presentation. We hope uh, that you live when you have learned and uh, that you will uh, join us in our efforts that are aimed at uh, protecting our environment on which millions of people in our region depend and uh, in protecting our biodiversity. Um, so I am going to today, alongside uh, our partners from Kenya and the Democratic Republic of Congo, as Maxim has said, we are going to be discussing about our ongoing oil exploitation efforts in Uganda and the grave, grave impacts over this exploitation that we have already seen, in addition to those that are expected if nothing is done. So we hope that we will do something after this presentation. And um, yeah, before I um, begin my presentation, I would like to tell you uh, about a saying. I would like to share with you a saying that uh, Nigerian communities who live in the Niger Delta where oil exploitation activities are ongoing, say. I visited the communities um, in uh, 2019 and uh, Afigo had been there prior to that time in 2018. And uh, these communities have a very colorful saying about oil. I am going to tone it down because it's too colorful, but in a nutshell, they say that oil is the spawn of the devil or simply put oil is a child of the devil. And the communities say this because our oil exploitation in the Niger Delta has led to immense, immense impacts, not only on the environment, but on the livelihoods of uh, millions of people who live in the Delta. As a result of uh, the destruction of uh, the environment in the Niger Delta and the destruction of uh, the livelihoods of people who live in the Delta, there is a high crime rate, particularly kidnapping in the Niger Delta. Now, these negative impacts of oil have been termed as the oil curse. And uh, unfortunately, we don't see that the oil curse is only experienced um, in uh, Nigeria. Uh, people need to wear in order to be able to hear i see some don't have um you can hear me okay great okay that's great so um unfortunately the oil cars isn't only experienced in nigeria all over african oil producing countries we see that past present generations and even children who are yet to be born experience the impacts of oil. Past generations and current generations lose livelihoods and live in an unclean and healthy environment. And generations that are yet to be born stand either to be miscarried or to be born with deformities. Now, amidst, um, amidst the oil curse and amidst um, the fact that we know that oil portends negatively for the environment and livelihoods, Uganda discovered oil commercial quantities of oil in 2006 in the Albertine Graben. Um, if you look on the left, you'll see the Albertine Graben on the left of the map. Now, um, to date, 6.5 billion barrels of oil have been discovered. And of these, up to 1.7, between 1.4 to 1.7 billion barrels are recoverable. Next slide, please. Um, unfortunately, um, the area, like uh, Maxim told you, where oil was discovered in Uganda is the Albertine Graben, is a very, very environmentally sensitive and also very biodiverse. It also has a huge human population. Let me share with you about how environmentally sensitive and biodiverse that area is. It contains a 70% of Uganda's national parks eight out of 15 of our protected uh, forest reserves, and uh, it contains over 50% of Africa's bird species. The area also is home to um, plants, amphibians, um, and birds, and others that are very, very important to, you know, to all humanity, but to Ugandans and to Congolese and people in Africa in general. Next slide, please. 
So the development of uh, oil in such an eco-sensitive and biodiverse area, which supports tourism, agriculture, uh, climate stabilization, and, and performs other roles was uh, very, very concerning for not only Ugandans, but the global community as a whole. A number of concerns were raised and uh, voices have been raised um, requesting that oil is not exploited in the eco-sensitive Albertine Graben, but uh, the Ugandan and government and the oil companies operating in Uganda haven't listened to these voices. They decided to go ahead and develop Uganda's oil resources under three main projects. The first project or, and the biggest upstream project where oil will be extracted from Murchison Falls National Park, uh, one of Uganda's oldest, largest and most visited national parks, so very important to us, is the Tilenga oil project. Then the other project, and the Tilenga oil project is operated by Total Energies. Then the other project is the Kingfisher oil project. This project, um, oil will be extracted under this project from under the bed of Lake Albert. Lake Albert is shared with the Democratic Republic of Congo, and then it will be taken to well pads, a number of which are around uh, Lake Albert, two of them are too near, are going to be located too near the, 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 the lake. And then after it's been extracted, some of the oil will be taken to one oil refinery, while another will be transported by the, to global markets by the East African crude oil pipeline. And uh, you know, this brings me to our third project, the third major project. Okay, the third major project, which is the East African crude oil pipeline. Now that pipeline, if it is constructed, it will be the longest heated crude oil pipeline in the world, and uh, it will be 1,443 kilometers, and it is expected to transport 216,000 barrels of oil per day from the oil fields, the Tileng and Kingfisher oil fields, to uh, Tanga, the port of Tanga in Tanzania, and on to export markets. Thank you. Next slide, please. So, um. All the, all the oil projects in Uganda, the Tilenga, Kingfisher, and the ECOP, or the East African Crude Oil Pipeline, you know, they've raised, raised concerns and they pose immense uh, risks and threats, as I said earlier. Among these, and some of the risks and threats have already materialized. So currently, we have a uh, oil roads, what, what our government is calling the oil roads. Oh, I forgot to say that the Kingfisher oil project is being developed by uh, the China National Offshore Oil Corporation from China. And then the eco project is being led on by uh, Total Energies. But um, you know, the partners under that project are the CINOC as well, the China National Offshore Oil Corporation, as well as the Ugandan and Tanzanian governments. Now, all those projects, have immense risks and threats. And some of these we are already seeing. For instance, uh, oil roads have been constructed by the government of Uganda. Notably, a huge paved road has been constructed in Murchison Falls National Park in order to support our total energies to extract for oil from the, the national park. And uh, tourism operators have uh, complained and said, and also conservationists uh, such as Afiego have complained and noted that um, developing a paved road in a national park, first of all, is going to hurt um, the biodiversity because some will be separated from their breeding grounds. Some will not be able to cross a paved road to look for food so they could become extinct. But also in terms of tourism, it, Ugandan tourism is very biodiversity best. We need biodiversity in order for our tourism industry, which is one of the biggest foreign exchange, exchange earners in the country to survive. Now our tourism operators say that paved roads hurt the tourism experience. Tourists prefer um, roads, dirt roads, as opposed to, to the paved roads. So they've also complained about that. But uh, roads have not only been constructed in Murchison Falls National Park, but uh, through forests, such as uh, a road has been constructed, uh, is being constructed through Budongo Forest in order to support um, uh, oil exploitation activities. Overall, um, the environmental concerns that we have is that uh, over 2,000 square kilometers of protected areas 
are going to be affected as a result of our oil and gas development or exploitation in Uganda. In addition, as regards biodiversity, the area in which the oil activities are ongoing, we have over 49 IUCN red listed species of concern. So these, there, 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 there is heightened risk against them because of our oil activities. Uh, we have uh, the chimpanzees, the Eastern chimpanzees. We have uh, elephants. We have uh, the Nehans francolin, all of which have been listed by IUCN as being endangered and therefore deserve to be need more protection measures. Unfortunately, with oil, you know, we are putting them more at risk as opposed to uh, protecting them. In terms of uh, socially, already tens of thousands of people have had their land being taken away or being compulsorily acquired for oil and gas projects. Now, unfortunately, in our setting, international best practices of compulsory land acquisition don't work. Often, and this is what has happened uh, in, under the Tilenga project, under the oil refinery project, and it's happening under the East African crude oil pipeline project. Often poor communities whose main asset of production is land are told that you cannot use your land. Your land is going to be acquired for the eco project or for the Tilenga project or the oil refinery project, and you cannot use it anymore to set up any new developments or to um, cultivate uh, perennial food and cash crops. When you tell that to a poor family that survives off the land, the impacts are immense and they are many. They range from when you stop people from growing food, perennial food crops, families experience food insecurity, then families lose uh, cash, lose uh, sources of income. And when they lose sources of income, we see domestic violence, especially against women increasing. We see that uh, families can no longer pay school fees for their children, so children drop out of school. And uh, this most especially affects girls because in our setting, you know, more, more, you know, boys are valued more than girls are, unfortunately. So when families have to decide we have less money, who do we pull out of school? We find that girls are usually pulled out more. Now, um, you know, and the impacts, those are some of the short-term impacts that we have seen under all the oil projects. Now, Afiego did research that was published in 2020, and we found that these impacts are not only short-term, but they are long-term long, long -term as well. Usually when families are stopped from uh, using their land, we, they, and it's a, cut, a cut off debt is said, they call it a cut off debt through which you're told you can no longer use your land for this and this and this and that. Um, government and the oil companies, you know, despite them being multinationals, spend several years for the eco project, they've spent three years for the oil refinery project, over five years were spent without paying communities money. Now, when communities don't have money and they don't have food, they start to incur debt. When they are paid later on, three years later, five years later, they are very indebted and you find that the compensation that they get, they spend on paying up for their debts. That means that the little money they remain with cannot enable them to buy equivalent land size, land elsewhere. And with land being the major factor of production, you find that a family that could earn um, more than 300,000 Ugandan shillings, I wish I could convert that to euros, you know, for you, but uh, yeah, but a family that could earn 300,000 Ugandan shillings annually before cannot earn it anymore because they have a smaller land size. And also because their compensation, compensation values reduce because a land values in Uganda really appreciate, yet people are paid based on uh, the, 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 the money that they were promised perhaps three years ago for the eco or five years ago for the oil refinery. Now you find that um, land values have appreciated and families cannot afford land. So we've found a number that have bought land that's cheaper, but is less fertile. And that's why that land is cheaper. That means that their ability to produce food and also to produce cash crops through which they make money is negatively affected. So we've seen those medium term impacts, but we also envisage that there'll be long term impacts because if a family 
is impoverished. It means that they won't educate their children. They are not able to access good health care. They're not able to access safe water. So we are going to see a, a, a cycle of poverty being perpetuated over and over again because of other land acquisition processes. Then uh, we have other economic risks. Uganda is already greatly indebted and um, you know, our debt to GDP ratio is over 50% at the moment. And this is uh, because uh, a lot of money has been uh, borrowed to be invested in the oil sector. And unfortunately for us in Uganda, the World Bank did uh, research and uh, produced uh, a research report in 2016 things could be maybe better or worse, perhaps worse because Uganda is poorer today. The World Bank said that for every shilling that's invested in an infrastructure project in Uganda, less than half a shilling is recouped. So we don't expect things to be different for the oil sector based on what we've seen in other countries and based on what we are seeing, debts are being accrued, but we don't believe that there will be value for money being realized, yet our country is going to be left highly indebted. Then uh, climate change, you know, that is a major, major concern for us. It's uh, estimated that over 100 million metric tons of carbon will be produced when, if, Uganda's oil resources are exploited. Now, there are arguments that uh, poor countries such as Uganda should be allowed to exploit their resources because, you know, they'll, they'll become so that, you know, they can develop. We haven't seen an African country that has developed because of exploiting oil. But even then, Uganda's major economic activities are agriculture, tourism, fisheries and others that are nature dependent. So if Uganda is insistent on producing oil, it's like we are cutting off our own legs, saying we need to produce oil to develop, yet we will hurt other sectors such as agriculture and tourism on which we heavily depend and which have great potential, like I'll show later. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm being told that 300,000 is uh, 72 euros. Thank you, it's equivalent to 72 euros. So um, I thought I would show you some of the 49 uh, threatened species that are found uh, in, 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 in the Albertine Graben and are endangered. IUCN red listed species that are being further endangered as a result of uh, Uganda's oil and gas exploitation dreams. Next slide, please. Yes, and those are some of uh, the chimpanzees. We have uh, climbing lions in Queen Elizabeth National Park. There are no oil activities currently in Queen Elizabeth National Park, but unfortunately, there is an oil block called Ngaji Oil Block, and uh, the Ugandan government in 2019, the Ugandan government put it up for oil exploration licensing. Um, they failed to get a, a bid in 2016 because they had also put up Ngaji Oil Block in 2016 for licensing. And then they will put it up for oil exploration licensing in 2019. And if any company bids for Ngaji oil block in Queen Elizabeth National Park, it will mean that uh, Uganda's two oldest, biggest, and the national parks which receive the most visitors in Uganda will be uh, will have oil exploitation activities that are ongoing. That would be very, very dangerous and very catastrophic for environmental conservation efforts, for biodiversity, but also for the incomes of uh, over the 600,000 tourism operators that we have in Uganda. Next slide. Oh, and then this elephant. And now because of our oil activities that are ongoing, so unfortunately that's an elephant that was killed, um, that was found dead, um, about uh, a week or so ago, uh, it, it was found in Bugoma Forest. So what has happened that, that because of our oil exploitation activities, there is a lot of pressure on land and environmental resources in the Albertine grabbing. There is a lot of land grabbing from communities, but also um, companies that need huge tracts of land to for agricultural purposes in order to serve the oil sector and, and other and other industries want to grab forest land. So unfortunately, over 21 square kilometers of Bogoma forest was given away, was claimed by a cultural institution in Uganda, and uh, it was given away, illegal land titles were issued to the cultural institution. And this uh, cultural institution leased the land to a company called Hoima Sugar Limited, 
which is a growing sugarcane in Bogoma forest. Now there's already a lot of impact that's being seen. And the latest is that we saw that uh, the elephant was confused, was trying, was not seeing its usual uh, tracking route, and uh, it was found dead. Uh, investigations are being conducted uh, to understand the causes of death, but the elephant was found near the area where Hoima Sugar Limited is operating. So this is what we are seeing, and we do not want to see this because biodiversity is very important in and for itself, but also for human beings in general. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, we've uh, implemented a number of efforts. How catastrophic oil exploitation efforts in the Albertine Graben would be. We've implemented a number of efforts with uh, partners uh, from the DRC and Uganda, and uh, currently internationally and uh, with uh, East Africans. That's why Father Benedict is going to speak today. And the first thing that we did we was supported by IUCN Netherlands under the Green Livelihoods Alliance project to form a coalition or to strengthen existing coalitions, cross-border coalitions to enable us advocate for the protection of uh, cross-border eco-sensitive areas from oil exploitation. It's important to work with partners from the DRC because the Albertine grabbing, it extends up to Mozambique and other areas, but the area where oil discoveries are in Uganda are also shared with the DRC and there's oil also on the DRC side. So we felt we need to work together so that neither government touches oil in those areas to protect the environmental resources that we have and the biodiversity resources in there. So we have a coalition that currently does a lot of campaigning targeted at both the Ugandan and DRC governments to stop oil exploitation in our cross-border eco-sensitive areas in the Albertine Graben. Then uh, we've had a coalition and our partners have had our capacity built, who were again supported by IUC and Netherlands to have our capacity built. We didn't know how dangerous oil exploitation could be, uh, you know, prior to when, when oil was in, when we had that Uganda had discovered oil, we thought it's a good thing. It's black gold. We're told that 160,000 jobs are going to be created. Our GDP will increase. So the economic argument was strong. And, you know, it was difficult not to get excited. But then we had exchange learning visits to Nigeria, Ecuador, the U.S., and uh, to Ugandan communities as well. And we saw that uh, the promises of oil, the economic promises of oil, you know, hardly ever materialize, especially in African contexts, but that even in rich countries, it's difficult to avoid the environmental impacts of our oil exploitation. Next slide, please. So after learning about uh, the negative impacts of oil, we, decided to take the message because communities, all they knew is that we are going to be rich, we are going to be people like in the Middle East, you know, this is going to leave us better off than we were. And uh, we decided that we needed to debunk that untruth or those false, uh, false narratives that uh, oil exploitation leads to economic development. And uh, we've been, uh, since uh, 2018, we've been uh, implementing movement building efforts, grassroots movement building efforts, both in Uganda and the Democratic Republic of Congo, where we use tools such as film screenings, yeah, film screenings, radio talk shows, and others to tell communities about uh, the negative impacts of oil. We've also supported community exchange learning visits so people can understand the dangers of oil and uh, especially women and youth, so that they share with their fellow community members. Next slide, please. Yeah, we've had cross-border engagements. We've uh, filed court cases. Uh, there is a court case that's in France, and uh, it's uh, alongside Friends of the Earth France, as well as SUVI. Afiego and other Ugandan organizations are party to that suit. And we are saying that uh, Total didn't do enough due diligence to ensure that uh, the environment and communities are protected from uh, its Tilenga and ECOP oil projects. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, we also have a coalition with uh, international partners. It's called the Stop ECOP Campaign. Uh, we have a website and uh, we've been doing uh, an, a number of things, particularly among others, we've been doing financial advocacy where we are telling banks and insurers, export credit agencies and others not to finance 
the oil projects in Uganda because they won't be beneficial. Instead, they will be destructive. So we are saying put people over profits as opposed to putting profit over people. We've had our media engagements and a number of others. Next slide, please. Um, we've had a number of gains. You can read about them because I have very little time left. But uh, the challenges that we have, you can also read. But I think one of the biggest, biggest challenges that we have is that um, companies and the Ugandan government are still determined to produce oil despite the dangers that uh, oil production uh, poses. And uh, I'm told that uh, two days ago, Total was in, in a meeting uh, at, at this Congress. And they said that, um, you know, and if, if it was today, they wouldn't develop the Tilenga oil project and the eco project because of the climate change concerns. But they say that uh, production, they, uh, production sharing um, and product, not production sharing agreements, production licenses were issued to them in 2012 and they've invested a lot. So, you know, they need to go ahead with the project. But we say, you know, you've invested a lot, but what about the a lot that communities are going to lose as a result of your investment? Does in the lot that you've invested, does in the, what communities stand to lose matter? In our view, it matters because we also deserve to live. We deserve to live in a clean and healthy environment. We deserve to have incomes. We deserve to live decent lives. And we say that it is best if oil resources in the eco-sensitive Albertine Graben in Uganda and the DRC are left undeveloped. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Diana, for your powerful talk and problem analysis. Great to see your efforts. So if you have any questions for Diana, write them down, remember them, because you can ask them uh, during the panel discussion to her. I would like now to hand over to our second speaker, Father Benedict. He's now coming to the stage. Next slide, please. He's going to share his thoughts about climate justice and climate action in this current ecological crisis that the uh, Albertine Graben is facing. Uh, Father Benedict is a program manager for uh, Africa at the Laudato Si movement. Big applause for Father Benedict. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Good morning. And thank you, Diana. A presentation on the ECOP and what is happening in Uganda and the DRC and even in Tanzania. Uh, we have been uh, working very closely with the faith based organizations. Um, and especially after the release of the POPs encyclical uh, called Laudato Si in 2015, which was just at the advent of the Paris Accord. Uh, Pope Francis released a document called the Laudato Si. Probably you've heard of it. And uh, in this document, he calls upon all people to unite to deal with the, with the crisis, uh, the ecological crisis which we're experiencing. And in this document, uh, he says that we need to listen to the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth, saying that all the problems, the social problems, uh, the economic problems, the political pro problems are all integrated. And so we need to find integral solutions to these problems. And, and so uh, the, just before the COP21 in Paris, this document was released. And it was kind of adding a moral voice to already politicized uh, doc, I mean, uh, rhetoric that was going around the, the issue of uh, the, the climate change. And so when uh, the Pope released this document, he called upon the political leaders who are attending the, the meeting in Paris really to, to go beyond uh, not just looking at the, the, the scientific aspects of climate change uh, and, and uh, you know, the politics around it, but also to go beyond and look at the, the, 
the way the social systems work, about the lives of the people, about those who suffer most. Because as you know, uh, many people who suffer due to the issue of climate uh, change are the poor. Uh, like what Diana presented, we have all these oil uh, and gas uh, explorations and, uh, and investments in Africa. We find that people who are suffering from all these investments are the poor. They, and if you go to the ground, you'll see that many people are really getting the impact. Recently, we had the locusts, you know, coming from all over. I don't know where they came from, but they were in the northern part of Africa. And so many people were left without food because there is hunger now. So the Pope is, was calling and is calling people indeed in this document to, to not only look at the, the crisis, uh, the climate crisis as something that is very scientific, but also to go also calling the Christians to go to their faith teachings. Like, uh, you know, say Pope Francis is uh, referring to St. Francis of Assisi who lived 800 years ago in Assisi. Now, my question is always, uh, when uh, St. Francis lived, did we have climate change? Did we have climate crisis 800 years ago? Maybe it had started, but so, what the Pope is saying in this document, Laudato Si, is that Christians, Catholics included, they need to go back to their faith and be good stewards of the environment. That their calling, their faith calling is about them serving God through creation, you know, seeing the presence of God in creation. And then, so in 2015, early 2015, a movement was born. It's called the Laudato Si movement. This movement was to make the words of Pope Francis in Laudato Si to, to become life, for people to leave the document, not just to be a document that is put on a shelf somewhere, but to become a document that people refer to, that they can put practices in place. And so the Laudato Si movement was born. And I remember we went to Paris uh, at the COP and we presented so many signatures around 900,000 uh, of them at the COP saying that this is the voice of faith leaders, that the political class, the UN and others should listen uh, to, these, uh, to these demands. And, uh, and so the movement has three areas of concern that we promote. We have what we call the ecological conversion. The ecological conversion is calling upon the people of faith to go back to their faith teaching. Uh, in the book of Genesis, we are told that God tells the people that we need to be good stewards of the environment. So when we have these teachings upon the people, they listen to this cry. They listen to the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth. And then, uh, so the ecological, uh, ecological conversion, we have programs like the season of creation that starts on 1st of September to 4th of October, where Christians come together, all Christian faith, they come together to pray, but also to act to act in a more precise way. But also we have what we call lifestyle change and, uh, and uh, footprint reduction. Footprint reduction, like we have a petition uh, that we are going to send to the COP in Glasgow. This petition is called a Healthy Planet, Healthy People Petition. And is the idea of collecting these signatures and sending there for the political leaders who will be meeting at the COP to really listen to this, the demands of the people on the ground, including the people in Africa and in Uganda, about the, the ECOP and even in the DRC. And another program that we have is uh, what we call the, 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 the prophetic advocacy uh, or public policy, where we call upon the faith leaders to divest from fossil fuel, for example, to divest from what uh, the, the invest. We have so many uh, different uh, organizations and entities that have divested uh, from fossil fuels. They, they have removed their shares from you know, these companies that are continuing to invest in, the, in, in gas and oil. And so to focus on another alternative, you know, a, a green energy, for example. And so these are the three areas that we are working on. And um, we say that uh, for us as faith leaders, and even when we visited Hoima and uh, Tanzania and other places, but to, to be with the people on the ground. So we are building a movement of people who are co convinced from the heart. It's not just about the politics or the science around the climate change, but people who uh, can relate with the, what you're saying. And so the faith leaders 
uh, we went to Uganda and other places, and we are building this movement called the Laudato Si Animators. These are people who have learned about the document Laudato Si, and they live in the community small groups where they discuss and they relate with the issues on the ground. They take action. So we have planting of trees. They do protests against the ECOP. They write later letters to their national leaders to, so that the national leaders can listen to them. And then we have some demands that uh, uh, there is a letter that is going to be released and it's already uh, being spread around. Maybe you'll get a copy at the end of this. Um, and it is a letter that is addressed. It's an open letter to IUCN. And uh, the, the request is that the ICU, IUCN should make a public statement and put in place an ad hoc group on the Tilenga Kingfisher ECOP oil projects. And some of the demands are that <clears throat> to adopt and publicly declare as soon as possible an IUCN position to oppose the Tilenga Kingfisher ECOP projects and in support of the biodiversity protection in Uganda and Tanzania. And also engage with the governments of Uganda and Tanzania to promote a biodiversity protection policy to replace the current destructive policy. And also create an ad hoc working group to follow through on the, on, the, on the above demands. And also invite the stop ECOP coalition representative to brief and an ad hoc group on an ongoing uh, basis. So these are some of the demands and uh, we will uh, be giving this later after this meeting, we'll be distributing. And so if you have any questions or any um, inquiries about, uh, about this, we are very ready to respond to you, but we call upon you to join us in promoting this uh, letter of the POP uh, or the, uh, the recommendations of the POP in Lauda to see through also the faith leaders and all people of good faith. So thank you so much for giving me this chance. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Father Benedict. That was a powerful talk, thanks. Yeah, so the voice of uh, leaders like you is very important to mobilize uh, others. Amazing, very good. Uh, I would please save your questions uh, for the panel discussion. Uh, I would now like to uh, hand over to our next speaker, Bantu Lukambo. He is director of the um, development, uh, innovation for the development and protection of the environment, IDPE. Uh, that's a Congolese NGO, and he has recorded a uh, message for us. Uh, he will intervene remotely. Uh, and his message is about uh, the impacts of oil exploitation in Uganda and DRC and the role of uh, communities in, in this. So we're waiting for the technical staff to, to start the, the audio. Okay, so I think in the meantime, we are trying to uh, start the, the audio.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bandu Lukambo. I am the director general of a local NGO named Innovation for the Development and the Protection of the Environment, IDPE in short. Our topic is entitled The Impact of Petroleum in Uganda and in the DRC. The role of local communities and autochthones. It is since the year 2005 that the coalition of Congolese politicians and people from the British enterprise Soko International wanted to exploit the petroleum from the Block 5. This block located in the Virunga National Park and at least 48% is located in the fields of local communities and 42 is located in the Virunga National Park. As you know, more than 500,000 families depend on the Edward Lake. They live thanks to this lake. Apart from that, there are some migratory birds that come from Europe, from Asia, from America in winter season. They come to Nedify in the Virunga National Park. To mean, the Virunga National Park contains many species of animals that deserve our attention. Among challenges, when Soko Enterprise wanted to exploit the petroleum, the population did not agree. That is why this organization has developed other strategies to impose themselves on the ground. During the seismic test activities in the Edward Lake, as the communities did not agree to the project, Soko International Enterprise has used, first of all, corruption, has used torture, has used intimidations. Soko Enterprise has used another strategy of mobilization of certain armed groups for their security and for muzzling the resistant to the project. Soko Enterprise has used the poisoning of animals, the case of the three elephants at Nyakakoma and the vultures. Soko International has used another strategies of dysfunction and manipulations of the ignorant communities. Among our actions, we as IDPE, Innovation for the Development and the Protection of the Environment. We are member of the civil society. The population did not have enough arguments to face this company. That is why we had to communitize the debate. We have made the communitization of debate. And after that, we have also made the traveling of exchange in the petroleum exploitation zones. We have built a movement of resistance. After that, we have made the community mobilization. And then at the end, we have organized civil actions against this project. Our current fear is that we risk losing lands of communities because, as we said before, 42% of the Block 5's space is located in the field of local communities and 48 in the Virunga National Park. To mean, if this project is accomplished, we run also the risk of disappearance of mountain gorillas 
that exists in three countries in Rwanda, in Congo, and in Uganda. If this project is realized, we run also the risk of having conflicts due to water and soils pollution. We run the risk of a new vague of immigrants towards Europe. We run the risk of resurgence of terrorist movement. And uh, the reason of our resistance. For sure, we are not against this project because the government is telling us that it's from this project that we are going to have the salvation of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But we are against to exploit the petroleum from the protected zones, from the protected sites. That's we are against. And the project does not respect the national and international norms about the environment. We are against this project because there was no environmental impact study. We are against this project because there is a risk of being discredited because of not respecting the commitments taken by the DRC at the regional and international levels. As our wishes, as the protection of the environment is a matter of everyone, we solicit you to hear our distress. Okay, I see that there is an uh, issue with the uh, with the uh, audio and the video. But uh, so, but I think the message is uh, clear here. Also, on the DRC part, uh, the issues are very similar as uh, at the um, Uganda. Uh, part the issue is very urgent so i'm i'm it's it's very good that idb uh, the organization is working uh, against the, the lobbying against the oil activities um so this makes it a true transboundary project so i would now have to uh, in, i would like to invite diana and benedict uh, to sit here with me for uh, a short panel discussion in which I can ask them your questions to them. Welcome, welcome. Does somebody has a question? Yes, uh, we, have, we have a microphone here. Could you start with your name and your organization and then your question? Well, sorry. Okay. okay, that's good. Uh, my name is Siraj uh, Muhammad from Kurdistan region of Iraq. That I see from the problems that you are talking about uh, regarding to the impact of the oil companies on the environment at all. As we know that all the companies before starting the activity on the land, they need to prepare the environmental impact assessment report for the government. So if the, the company itself following the instructions and mitigation measures, management and monitoring plans that exist inside the, this report. I think these problems that you are talking about that maybe it will be reduced to the minimum, as we know. But there is, I think that I see from your talk that there is, you can see like the kind of some problems with the government itself. Maybe the government not follow these instructions that exist inside the report. So if there is this report, the government should monitor the environmental impact assessment and after that these problems will reduce it so if there is no these instructions i think at this time your rule it will be started your rule it's appreciated i know you did uh, good things and your program is good but i think the the construction uh, against the you can say destruction is different so we, you are trying to do something for the environment but there is uh, you can say like the government or the company that contaminate the environment may be faster than you 
for this reason, I think you should have a program for the government itself, just to try to make him uh, following the instructions or to stop this destruction to the environment. Otherwise, I think you cannot, um, you can say, conserve the environment at all. I think your, your work, it will be very, very, you can say hard that I, I see from you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to comment on this, that you need to build the capacity of the, of the government? Yeah, I wanted to say um, very quickly, um, thank you so much. And um, yes, an environmental and social impact assessment was uh, prepared and uh, for all the projects and uh, approvals were received in uh, 2019 and 2020. Certificates were issued for the Tilenga, Kingfisher and uh, ECOP. Unfortunately, Nigerians, I'm sorry, I'm going to say this, Nigerians talk about environmental racism. racism. Multinationals do the best in developed countries or they do their best. We find that in our, in our context, they do the least. I was just speaking with a gentleman from Uganda Wildlife Authority who was in the audience today. And he said that uh, Total has refused to offset 153 hectares that they are going to take in Machison Falls National Park. Yet the National Uganda's National Environment Act of 2019 mandates that they should offset and buy those 153 hectares elsewhere so that elephants have a place to live and uh, do not, we do not increase the human wildlife conflicts that we see, but they are refusing to do it, you know? So they do that list. So whether you have an SCR report that has been approved or not, you know, the guidelines are rarely, um, you know, are rarely respected. And uh, um, experts, SCR experts have uh, reviewed these reports, particularly the Netherlands Commission for Environmental Assessment and uh, ILO, Environmental Law Worldwide USA, and you find that they, they come extremely short. They play up the benefits, um, the oil companies play up the benefits that Ugandans will, they say Ugandans will enjoy and downplay the negative impacts. And when they downplay the negative impacts, you find that they won't be able to address them to avoid them or mitigate or, you know, so the SCR, SCR reports are insufficient. They cannot help us avoid the environmental and social dangers. And that's why you see even when they exist, we see a lot of social impacts that are not being avoided and are not being mitigated amidst the ongoing land acquisition processes. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. There's time for one small other question. Okay. Um... Thank you, both of you. Uh, my name is Seth. I work with Arusha Ghana. Uh, my question is to uh, both of you. Um, Diana, um, how involved are other CSOs, Ugandan CSOs, um, either as a coalition or force, um, you know, towards this effort? And also um, to Bishop, um, Ladato C, um, do you involve um, other faith groups who are also motivated um, and in their holy books also uh, prompt them to environmental uh, care and protection. Um, and how widespread is to see in Africa, other countries in Africa? Yeah, so are you building coalitions and how widespread is uh, this? Maybe I'll start and then I can go. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, <laughs> Excuse me. So we, uh, the, the Laudato Si movement, since it was born, well, the encyclical is a letter that is addressed to Catholics, but also non-Catholics. And so our programs actually target everyone. We have like now, as I said, we have the season of creation that we are working with other faith leaders because uh, the climate crisis is not for a particular group. So we cannot solve it as a particular group, say Catholics or whatever. We are bringing in everyone and uh, so in fact, the season of creation was started by the, the Orthodox church. And also we have Muslims and others, we are coming together as faith leaders, calling upon our people to go back to their teachings, to their traditions, to their faith teachings, to care for creation. And so even on the ground in Africa and other places, we are working with other people of other faiths to, uh, to promote this document and uh, to call upon, uh, you know, climate, climate action and climate justice. Thank you. 
Okay, and uh, you know, um, very quickly, uh, we're working with other civil society in Uganda. We are, but uh, it's difficult. We operate in a very repressed civic space where when you say protect the environment by not doing this, you're labeled as being anti-development. So while we have uh, certain partners and we see that youth groups and women groups are more likely to speak out, you find that um, a number of other well-meaning organizations that are against and would have loved to speak out are unable to because they fear um, state reprisals. Thank you. Thank you so much. So with this, our session has come to an end. I really enjoyed it. Please remain seated because we still have our surprise guest. Please, can you uh, start our uh, pre-recorded message from our surprise guest? The, um, so remain seated for one more minute and relaxed and to, to see this video from uh, Father Josh. He is coordinating, uh, he's the coordinator of the sector of ecology and creation at the Vatican office. And he will have a, a video about his, uh, his concerns about the oil exploration. But before the video starts, please give a, a large applause for the speakers and the uh, technical people. And yourself for the questions. <laughs> okay, let's start. Hello, best wishes and greetings from the Vatican Tech Castry for promoting integral human development. Happy to join you all in Marseille as you are taking part in the IUCN Congress. And let us hope and pray that the Congress will come out with the groundbreaking global framework to protect biodiversity. Congratulations for organizing this side event on oil extraction in Uganda and Democratic Republic of Congo and the impact on indigenous communities and local people. We are really concerned. A few months ago, the International Energy Agency told us very clearly that if we are to remain within the catastrophic limit of 1.5 degrees centigrade temperature rise to avert a climate crisis. No future oil exploration to take place, starting on now. Now to hear that this is taking place in Uganda is going to be a carbon bomb. It is going to accelerate the climate emergency. It's going to affect biodiversity. You know, these are regions so rich in biodiversity. And thirdly, it's going to have impact on human rights, especially of the indigenous communities that live in those areas, and human rights and uh, local populations as corporations will take over your lands. So we join you in protesting against this exploration and we need to make sure that we can leave a livable home for everyone, for our children, for future generations. And for that, we cannot afford to permit this exploration. So let us together protect our God's creation, which is Earth, our common home. Thanks to all those who are leading this effort and count on the support of our dicastery, especially of the ecology sector. Thank you very much and God bless.